ongoing. The disclosures haven't really changed. Uh, I think you guys are very familiar with kind of getting everything right and then bogging out. Um, and that's what this, this talk, unfortunately, is about. Nothing like being the one to talk about complications. Um, but I, I, if I have one message to you, it's, it's to try to change the way that we you know, were all trained to practice what I would call 20th century complication management. We're kind of in the 21st century, and I'll talk a little bit about that. If you take a look here, this is a, this is a patient of mine, right? Do you guys see anything unusual about this x-ray? I'll help you out. That's my four-month follow-up. Uh, patient didn't have any pain, but there's a small little object on the, on the film. And uh, does anybody have any, somebody may know what it is. Do you guys have an idea what that is? I measured it because this had happened to me before, but I picked it up during the case, and I didn't pick it up this time. It's actually the end of an arthroscope, right? <coughs> And uh, again, is it gonna make a difference? I don't know, but it's one of these things where you don't want this to, to happen. I don't want it to happen to you. Uh, I think that it is an engineering issue with this technology. And so, um, you know, the point is, is that, you know, we, I, I talked to the patient and I had to say, I think there's a 50-50 chance of finding this. It's kind of a needle in a haystack. It's almost like the lead of a pencil, right? So. We did take her back and we did get it out and it happened to be the end of that arthroscope, right? But what I'm really trying to encourage you is, is to really sort of appreciate where we are going surgically, right? There's, we do a lot of open work, right? A lot of what we do is arthroscopic, robotic, and we're putting enormous stresses and strains on our instrumentation. And so the idea of training your staff, training your teams to, to be aware of things, what we've gotten to do is we've gotten, we still do sponge counts, but in our room, after every case, we do a tip check. We do tip checks on everything, drills, anchor delivery devices, uh, we do it on the scope. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage you guys to sort of understand that transition because I think it could affect anyone in your hospital or department if you're using a DaVinci robot. All these things are very, uh, ultimately, there a lot of, if we go to disposable instrumentation, it's a lot more fragile. Um, so I would just sort of put that out there to do a tip count on everything. Um, when we get into complications, I think Jim Glick, who uh, some of you have, have met in the past, and is really, I would consider, kind of the godfather of American hip arthroscopy, he, he came up with this saying, which are most complications the result of too little or too much traction on the joint. Uh, and that still holds true today. Complications, I would say, there's a variety, I won't get into some of the literature, but there's a variety of things that can happen, I think you guys are familiar with that. The real question is, what's the prevalence of this, right? And, and what qualifies as a complication? I would say in some reports, inability to access the joints considered a complication, right? In some, it's conversion to a total hip replacement in, let's say, less than six months. Um, but I'm gonna say, overall, most things in your practice, you should have a, a rate of hopefully 1% or less. This is gonna cover a lot of grounds, but um, uh, we'll talk about a few of these things. Um, and I put this up here as where I've seen um, lawsuits in the past, where I've seen malpractice. So just to sort of make yourself aware of where there's been issues. So the first thing has to do with pudendal, pudendal nerve irritation. And this also has to do with pudendal region problems. Um, and the concern basically is, is you're compressing this area and what's, how are you gonna avoid that? Well, in, the, in sort of the way I like to practice, I still practice with a post. But the idea is that when you use a post, you need to use a pad that's at least nine centimeters uh, for a radius along that post, right? You can't just take your standard trauma post and wrap it every time in cast padding because you may run into problems. That's where I saw uh, actually a lawsuit related to this actual um, issue. Um, so you gotta have a well padded thing. Now, there are systems that have come out in the last two years that are postless, right? And so I would say that takes your pudendal problem away and it may actually create more issues uh, but just realize that, that postless system is available and may absolve yourself of this problem, right? If you do have a pudendal nerve uh, neuralgia, typically my experience in neurologists will back this up, a, a sort of a numbness in that area typically resolves within six months. It's a painful six months for you because they will call you once a week saying it's not better, but typically that compressive neuropathy will improve within six months, uh, right? And occasionally I'll just kind of shuttle them to the urologist just to have uh, bring somebody else in to help with that. So again, using well-padded system. 
How about this issue of iatrogenic instability or dysplasia? And the big concern that, that I see is when somebody is presented as a retroverted acetabulin when in actuality they're not, right? And so we call that pseudo, at least the term I use, pseudo retroversion. And it can either be because of excessive lumbar lordosis or the AP pelvis is not situated just right. So you're actually over calling where the, where the anterior wall is. And as we've discussed in this, in this course, the uh, subspine can create a shadow mimicking that space, right? So how do you prevent that? You wanna make sure your films are appropriately centered. Um, you wanna make sure that if you do, are doing a case, you minimize how much soft tissue you're, you're uh, cutting. Um, and repairing the capsule or doing some sort of volume uh, preserving or, or restrictive procedure at the end. Um, and if ultimately, if you do have what you suspect to be gross instability, uh, a lot of times you may have to convert that patient to a PAO in the future. I think Vendome talked about salvaging sometimes for capsule work, but at the end of the day, you may have to convert to a PAO. This is, again, I brought this up on Friday night. We measure a lot of these angles, but the truth is the angles are not representative of either volume or coverage. And some of the geometry that Hal's talked about uh, today um, certainly reflects where we're, where we're missing out. Again, centering your x-rays. The Swiss, uh, when they talk about their experience, you want the, the um, symphysis pubis and the tip of the coccyx to be somewhere between uh, one and three centimeters. And if somebody's really over tilted, you've got to be very careful not to resect that anterior wall because that may be the only thing that's really restricting. <laughs> Again, that's why we use a false profile to kind of double check what we're managing. How about lateral fem femoral nerve? Uh, it can oftentimes be stretched and or cut, and that's because of the variability in the anatomy. We actually now spread all our corals with a hemostat. And I can't, I don't have a scientific study, but I can say anecdotally, I think that's helped. So that's a simple way to sort of kind of push some of this, the, the subfascial nerves out of the way. Um, ultimately, staying lateral to the, again, that lighthouse to the hip, the, the ASIS, I think is helpful. Again, anecdotally, I can say about 90% of these resolve in about a year, right? But to actually have some discussion with the patient to say you may have numbness in your leg is not unusual just as if you're going to be doing an anterior replacement. So we talked a little bit about that. Sided nerve injuries, uh, I would say most of these are going to be stretch injuries. Uh, certainly flexing your hip on the table uh, uh, may uh, be beneficial. But certainly, I think it's a, it's a matter of managing force and time. Uh, people uh, used to do EMGs on a sort of regular, is anybody doing EMGs on a regular basis with your arthroscopy? I don't think so. I don't think that's a standard of care. So it's really a matter of, we've gotten to where we've treated as a tourniquet where we say two hours is the limit on traction. And I would say most people have gotten to where you try to let, rest the leg at least at an hour. And uh, that's not necessarily in stone, but it's just to say, it's okay to let the leg rest, you know, improve blood flow uh, and whatnot. And this is what I call sort of the, the safe frontier. The idea of hubris when you're actually in there trying to do something that you probably shouldn't be, and that applies to all of us, right? So time is your enemy, ultimately, in this, in this situation. DVTs, um, the biggest predictor of a DVT is a prior DVT. And so if you know somebody that's had a, a prior DVT, you should get a, a coagulation hematologist involved to have a plan about what to do. Uh, there's different arguments about how you should prophylax. I prophylax all my patients uh, uh, with Xeralto, right? And so I do that. Uh, they're pediatric, I put them on a little bit of aspirin, but that's just my, my way of practicing. Uh, we had two DVTs on Lovenox over about a, a seven year period. And so Xeralto has been a nice way to avoid injections and take it by mouth. Uh, just as a survey hands, does anybody routinely put people on aspirin? Yeah, pretty common. How about Lovenox or heparin? And then uh, Zeralto? Yeah. yeah. So the reason why I bring this up is there, again, a legal case where somebody uh, did a hamstring repair and there was a fatal PE in that case. Uh, and the lawyers enjoy that because if you've not taken the appropriate measures to document how you're gonna manage that or, or prophylax it, it's just good to have that as a, on, on a record. So it's not meant to scare you, it's just merely to say, you know, in your in your sort of operative plan, have an idea of how you're gonna manage the hypercoagulated state. And usually it's people you can't really predict, they show up, they're either factor five, 
they've got some other protein CRS um, uh, deficiency. Um, this is more of an issue of, of uh, sometimes uh, the idea of our, our equipment is still quite primitive. I would say a majority of what we use is still about, uh, you know, we're approaching 25 years on a lot of our scope technology. And I think it really creates a lot of iatrogenic issues. Um, so you really have to be sort of careful. And I would say most of the times orthopedists, we're trying to just muscle our way in. And the quick answer is you've got to understand that everything you're doing is under magnification. And Ben Dome always had a very nice uh, wise saying, which is if you can't see it, you're probably damaging it, right? And that's very much the case. I think our optical technology is going to improve quite a bit. So your awareness of your space will improve. I think our instruments will get smaller, which will improve things as well. But just realize uh, you want to minimize your footprint on the inside with avoiding excessive force. So you can use fluoroscopy. Again, I always recommend starting small and not dilating or enlarging until you know exactly where you are and, and avoiding undue force in that space. The failure to access the joint is, it was a complication listed by Ricky Biller in his original article. And I would just say that, you know, ultimately the hip joint is a very highly constrained area and traction ultimately is essential to be able to get in. Um, positioning is a very important in planning. Uh, occasionally, if you cannot get in, there is a technique of what's called a peripheral compartment start. And that's basically where you start on the femoral neck and then subsequently work your way into the central compartment. And I would encourage you guys to look that up as a bailout. Ultimately, if you feel like you can't get in centrally, you can always start on what's called a peripheral start and then work your way centrally. Again, we talked about visualization. We talked about the, the issues with, again, these protrusio cases are not, they're not necessarily ideal for a scope at this point. Uh, maybe surgical dislocation is, is showing up presented. Uh, this came up on my boards because I had a boards case built with this. So when I originally did a case, I had one case where the, uh, the drill went across the acetabulum. It was devastating for me, you know, it was a terrible ego blow. Uh, the board examiners didn't really think much about it, but I thought it was like the worst thing to ever happen um, uh, in, in that sort of thing. But the idea is that you've got a lot of distortion with a 70 degree camera. And the one lesson I learned is, is the deeper the socket, the more likely this is gonna happen. So if you've got a profunda case or a slight protrusio, you've got a lot of versional changes, your chances of going across the um, articular surface with your drill is very high. So what we try to teach is always observe that articular surface when you're drilling and redirect when you need to. The implants have gotten a lot better. We've got a lot smaller diameter drills, but it's still, I think, an issue, especially if you're putting in a peak implant. If you're putting in peak implants and you go across the, the acetabulum and leave a peak implant in the joint, that can be pretty catastrophic. So you always want to be able to look at that. Here's the image from that case, right? And you may say, well, how do you manage that? First of all, you want to prevent it. But if this does happen, I just treated it like a microfracture and they did okay. I think ultimately it doesn't create an incongruity, but it does create atrogenic damage, right? So you do worry about that. HO, um, this is primarily an issue around the hip. I think everybody's seen cases where there's a lot of trauma around the hip and that's where you run into issues. The key is to minimize your trauma and minimize the amount of bone debris you leave behind. So we try to educate people is make sure that your suction is always working, you're getting that debris out of the field and that, and that helps that. I put patients on naprosyn. I found that to be a safe way with minimal issues. Some people have said that that's not enough. You need to go on endosyn, but I found the headache issues with that to create non-compliance. Uh, does anybody else use anything else? Uh, Celebrex or anything? Meloxicam. Mobic? Meloxicam. Anybody else? Celebrex. Celebrex. Pretty happy. And how many weeks? Uh, three weeks, 200 BID. Okay. 200 BID, three weeks? Three weeks, 15 milligrams once a day. 15? 15. Once a day for three weeks? Yeah. Right. So the naproxen I use is I use 500 BID for a minimum of three weeks and usually um, six just for anti inflammatory. Um, one of my final comments would be about we're doing all this bone work and my concern is we're fixing one problem, maybe creating another. And that is, we're not really creating a lot of, of, of acute femoral neck fractures, but you have to be aware of this. And the bone density issues, especially in these female patients, in my population, it's about 60% female. I'm constantly concerned that we're changing the natural history of one problem, and we're creating the risk of a femoral neck fracture down the road. And that would be something where you always want to stay as conservative as you can on the neck and limit that. Um, the cadaveric evaluations, Rodrigo Modonas, they looked at this, you can take about 30% of the femoral neck, but some of the other biomechanical data suggested if you notch in, in the wrong area, 
it could just be 10% and you can create a stress riser, right? So you want to sort of uh, manage this and if need be, uh, be able to pin these quickly. This is an example of what you may see. You can see how soft this bone is. Um, I was ordering DEXA scans early in my career on patients I thought were high risk, perimenopausal. Uh, you felt like they were like cachectic, they had the female athlete triad. Again, not scientific, but I can tell you anecdotally, I found no good correlation between DEXA scans and the femoral neck density when I went in on a case. So I don't know if anybody, the other faculty have any comments on that, but um, do you guys have any thoughts on osteopenia or porosis, or does anybody else manage it a different way? So something to think about. And you can use a lot of ways to manage that. You can use fluoro, you can use interop CT. There's ways to make sure that you're not taking too much. So we talked about optimizing you know, patient selection, avoiding uh, certain uh, contraindications. I can't remember, somebody asked me what my versional limits were, and I thought 40 on antiversion, about 10 on retroversion. So again, if somebody's too big, too arthritic, or too malformed, arthroscopy is definitely a, you gotta think not once, twice, but probably three times before you do it. So again, I wanna thank everybody for being here. If you're not a member of ANA, please think about it. We have uh, their ANA applications for national and international members. Uh, ISHA, again, uh, the meetings next year are great.